excuse me. Just there. What do you think your dad's favorite holiday is? It's Father's Day? Is it really? Does your dad like Father's Day? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Why do you think he likes Father's Day? Because it's about him. Because it's all about him. What do you do to celebrate your dad on Father's Day? Give him presents? Give him presents? You have to give two people presents on Father's Day because, because guess what? Because why? Because this year, Charlie's birthday is on Father's Day. No way. Happy Father's Day, Charlie. <laughs> Are you going to do anything special for him? Build a castle. Build a whole castle? What's the castle going to look like? Um, what's his favorite, what's your dad's favorite food? Is it pickles? I don't know. Black! Uh, his mom's food. His mom's food? What does his mom cook for him? Uh, Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese? Nope. Nope. That's not. That's incorrect? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's Indian food. It's Indian it. food? My favorite food is applesauce. <laughs> Mom, can I have this applesauce? Don't call her mom. Don't call her mom? Okay, I'm sorry. What is his favorite color? Blue. Blue? And okay. that's my favorite color. That's your favorite too. color too? Do you think it's genetic? Genetic! <laughs> how old do you think your dad is? I think it's 35. Guess how old I am? Uh, 45. 45, close enough. Oh boy. We'll count it. You want some? No. No? Do you think he's one of the best tennis players of all time? Yeah. He is? That's amazing. What's the silliest thing that your dad does? Does he put his foot on his head like you are? <laughs> no. I can do that too. You can do that too? Do you think I can do that? Kind of. It hurts a lot though. He a playhouse for us. What do you do inside the playhouse? Can I have some? Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day! Perfect. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day! Well, good morning. Good morning, Christ Church family. It is my pleasure to welcome you and worship with you this glorious Father's Day. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who is here in the room with me and also those who are worshiping with us online. If you are new, I'd love to get a chance to greet you personally. I'd like to meet with you for Christ Church in Five right outside the glass doors just to answer your questions and tell you how we can help you grow and thrive. And now, will you please join me in a responsive call to worship? The Eternal Heavenly Father, who loved us and set us free from our sins, who loves us still with a love that will not let us go, and who will love us forever as his children, calls us to worship him today. Let us worship God.
please remain standing to state together with joy what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From there he shall judge the I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the community of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Lord. Please be seated. <laughs> Would you all pray with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today with thanksgiving and with praise. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the brand new mercies that you give to us each morning. I thank you for everyone that is gathered here in person or in line. And Lord, we thank you that as we gather, you are here in our midst and we ask that we be transformed in, in your presence. Father, I ask your seat, your blessing on this season of barbecues and vacations and outdoor activities. But this season also brings very real challenges, tragic loss of life in different parts of the country, widespread grief, the reality of higher prices, 
and the feeling of uncertainty that can come from such times. But even so, we will not despair. We lift our eyes to the hills, for our help comes from you. Father, we pray for our mission partners, domestic and global, who are responding to the needs in our area and around the world. We ask that you strengthen them and give them your guidance as they serve. I lift up all the people of God as we seek to respond to the challenges and issues of our time with the love and wisdom of Christ. I lift up my Christ Church family as we respond to the needs of the poor, the sick, and the marginalized in this community and the wider Chicagoland area. And on this special day, we give thanks and celebrate fathers and all of the men in our lives who have encouraged, inspired, and mentored us. We ask your blessings on them and we pray for your hand of protection on our families today. But we also recognize that there are those among us who are mourning rather than celebrating. We stand with them today and we ask that you would wrap your arms around them and bring them peace. Father, we rejoice in the gift of freedom and we recognize the historical significance of Juneteenth today. We thank you for the freedom to live, worship, and work together as one family, equals in the body of Christ. And as children of the Heavenly Father, we stand united in your love. Today and every day, Lord, we worship you. We bless you for creating us in your image. You gave us your precious son, and we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to transform us ever closer to the image of Christ. And as one family of faith, we join our hearts and voices and pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Again, I want to welcome all of you to the service this morning. I'm so thrilled to see all of you. Um, if you are new, I'd love to have a chance to chat with you, answer questions for Christ Church in Five just outside of the glass doors. If you are new and you're online, we would love to connect with you. Also, you can let the online host know, and we will connect with you this week. You can let them know by typing new, and the host will connect with you this week. Um, I would also like to remind you um, that we have family movie night happening this week, and everyone is invited to our Butterfield campus next Wednesday night for an outdoor movie. The movie will start around 8.30, and the food trucks will arrive on, at four, on campus at 4.30. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring your neighbors and their kids, and a blanket for Disney's Big Hero 6 movie. Um, you will want to come early for the food trucks, and you can get details about this at the Christ Connect, at Christ Connect app or online. Um, we have some very exciting ministry news this week. There's a lot happening in our kids and student ministries. This past week, 97 students and 17 volunteer leaders went to Arkansas for ROCA. They enjoyed rich teaching, learning about the biblical discipline of rest, and they had opportunities to make new friends and, of course, have a lot of fun. This coming week, however, we have VBS. And starting Monday, tomorrow, 283 kids ages four to fifth grade will converge on our Oak Brook campus. This will be an awesome time for them to learn about God and to make friends and to have a blast. And so we're grateful for the 100 leaders who will be volunteering their time this week for the, these kids to really meet with Jesus. And it's just exciting to see all that God is doing in the different areas of ministry here at Christ Church please continue to pray for our kids and students. Pray that the students who went to Roca this past week will continue to grow in their faith and in the relationships that they've built. And then pray for the VBS kids that are coming this week, that they'll take the next step in knowing and believing God's love and grace. And just hearing about the wonderful things that are happening in our kids and students ministry, um, and as we pause to celebrate Father's Day, it makes me think of my own childhood. Um, for those of you that don't know, I am a Chicago native. I grew up in a close-knit family that consisted of my mother, my grandparents, 
two aunts and two uncles, and each impacted me in their own way. Um, I'm especially pleased that my grandfather is here this morning. Um, I grew up calling him Papa, and he is the person that I am celebrating today. Um, my grandfather grew up in Mississippi. He and his family lived on a farm, and they learned the meaning of hard work very early. Um, over the years, he relocated to Chicago, got married, had a family of his own. Um, but his incredible work ethic remains unchanged. He's one of the hardest working people I know, even retired. And there's nothing that, that, he's never been, that he has not been able to fix. Um, in addition to the importance of hard work, I learned the importance of trusting God. I learned from my grandfather that one need not be overbearing to be strong. I learned that it's important to work hard and play hard. And even as a busy retired person, um, my grandfather goes to the gym five days a week. He enjoys working around the house. He loves to do um, those word search puzzles, and he does them in dazzling, sparkling colors. They're beautiful to see, really. Um, he enjoys sipping good coffee and enjoying a slice of pound cake. And this could be where I get my fondness for cake also. But like my grandfather, we all have an influence on others. And giving is one way that we can positively inf impact our communities. And as the ushers come forward to receive the offering, consider how your contributions to Christ Church will make an impact on those around you and around the world. If you prefer, you can take out your phone and give using the app. And I want to give a special thank you to those who have given already or those who have set recurring, recurring gifts. Your gifts will have more impact than you know for years to come.
This is the Cochran family. We are the Cochran family, and we've been going to Christ Church for two years. What they don't know is that their dad is sitting directly behind them and hears everything that they're saying. I learned how to ride a bike from him, how to camp, and pretty much a lot of basic things, but I wouldn't really know them without him. I learned how to play chess and how to like take care of myself from him. I've learned a lot of dad jokes. <laughs> uh, he's the king of them and very proud of them. <laughs> but also just, I think I've learned how to you know, not take things so seriously sometimes and just have fun um, with the little things when the kids. One of my favorite memories uh, with my dad was when we built a greenhouse from scratch for my mom. It took a while and it was really fun and she was very happy. Now she has a place to store her thousands of plants. <laughs> He just lights up whenever anybody agrees to play a board game with him. Um, I think I like, I also like seeing Chad uh, be vulnerable with the girls. Um, you know, obviously he's always a teacher, but he's also really vulnerable at times and he's not afraid to show his weaknesses, which I think is wonderful for the girls to see and that takes a lot of strength to do. What my dad does to make me feel loved is just a lot of small things. If it's just saying, I love you, or just giving me a hug, or tucking me in at bed. Whenever I need someone to help me, he always helps me. And he teaches me to learn from my mistakes. The little things he does makes me feel loved. Like Every time he takes my car, he fills it up with gas. Like even if it's already three-fourths of the way filled, he'll fill it up all the way. Um, you know, he will do the dishes. Um, all those little, little things that he knows that I don't like to do, um, he does. Um, not because he likes them, but because he knows I don't like them, which I appreciate. He's very patient and kind, just like Jesus, and always finds a way to show us his love. If you saw your dad walking through the doors over here, what would be your reaction right now? Um, I would kind of just like, just like, like, make sure he doesn't see. <laughs> well, we have a surprise. Oh, oh stop. <laughs> oh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't know that. Happy Father's Day, Christ Church. Yes, happy Father's Day, Christ Church. So who is behind the screen when you're talking about someone? <laughs> I think that would be a scary sort of thing. We're so glad you're here with us today. I'm Dave Bianchin. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And if you're with us online or here in the sanctuary, it's great to be worshiping together on this day. We are um, at the end of our series on Philippians, uh, one of my favorite books, and I'd like to read to you this section from chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. So listen to God's Word. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. Again, we're glad to recognize Father's Day. We're going to have uh, some time of prayer at the end of the service about that, but I'm just so glad to welcome you today. 
As we work toward the end of our, our series, the theme of the series has been Philippians 1.27, which says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. I've gotten stuck on that word worthy quite a bit. I don't know about you, but I rarely feel worthy of the gospel. Don't we find ourselves kind of explained or identified in certain ways in our lives? And sometimes that's good, and sometimes I don't feel quite so good about it. If you come to the church and, and are looking for me, you'll find um, on my office door a name tag which gives my title and my word is work as visitation pastor, and that's my name tag, which you would see as well, and my business card has the same sorts of things on it. So that identifies me in a certain way. So I like those positive identifications, but I'm not so good on the ones that aren't quite so positive. I went to a wedding not too long ago, and I went to my nameplate for dinner, and this is what my nameplate described me as. <laughs> I wasn't quite so happy about that. Um, <laughs> so I'm not worthy, but I'm really not chicken either. <laughs> you know, friends, life is hard. Um, we have losses in life. We have difficult relationships. There are circumstances that cause deep concern and worry. And we all fight influences that lead us away from living that life that is worthy. As Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he does so in prison. Pastor Dan gave a wonderful background on Philippians last week. I want to point out one more thing about the church in Philippi. If you'll notice the book of Philippians, you'll find, unlike most of Paul's other letters, no quotes from the Old Testament. This was very much a Gentile church. There was no Jewish background to the church, and that's important because think about what that background brings. For the Philippians, there was no Ten Commandments, no warning from the prophets about how to live a responsible life, no wisdom literature to guide in a godly sort of way. So as Paul introduces the Christian faith to this church that he loves so much, he's concerned that they follow in the way that has been part of all of salvation history, bridging from the law and the prophets into the New Testament, Jesus' work and Paul's work as well. So he's concerned. He's concerned for the church, for individual believers, but he's also concerned for the church as a whole, that the church would be healthy. So in his last reflections on faith and on life, what the NIV calls these final exhortations uh, of Paul's ministry, we find three things that I think are really important, and I want to look at those three things this morning. The first is that we are to be reconciled with each other just as God has reconciled us to Himself. So as God has reconciled us to Him, that's supposed to ripple off into our lives and our relationships with other Christians. Secondly, we are given the opportunity in Christ to rejoice, rejoice throughout our entire lives because a very core value, one of the fruits of the Spirit, is joy. That's normative for us to live into. God has promised it to us. And finally, related to those two things, we are called to engage with things that develop a godly character and remind us of the need to reconcile and the opportunity to rejoice. So I'd like to look at those three things this morning on this Father's Day. Paul begins by reminding us to be reconciled to those in our lives. He focuses on two very prominent church leaders, uh, two women named Euodia and Syntyche, and he focuses on them and makes them, in a sense, an illustration of the call to be reconciled to each other. Now, why does he publicly do this? Because whether in leadership or, or just being part of the body, our relationships with each other affect the entire church. And when we are reconciled to each other and we're moving through problems and pain and challenges and crises, it benefits the entire church because the church then sees that reconciliation is possible. We can work through issues. We can get along with each other. So they're not only an illustration, but it's important to the life of this church that they be on the same page again. Tomorrow we will celebrate, we'll observe Juneteenth. You know that legislatively it, was, it originated in Galveston, Texas. And it's been celebrated annually on June 19th in various parts of the United States since 1865. That's the legislative reality. But the relational reality in our world is that that work's not done. 
the work of reconciliation, the work of, of deep fellowship with one another across racial lines, that's an ongoing challenge for us. And we as Christians who celebrate what Paul said, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are one in Christ Jesus. I hope the holiday tomorrow, as you reflect upon that, causes you to reflect upon those areas in your and on my life where we need to step across lines and we need to be reconciled and in good friendship with one another. It's an important day, and it reminds us how far we have yet to go. And in general, it's a tragic reality that we live broken lives in regard to each other. You can think about relationships in your life, family members, neighbors, coworkers, where, where things could be addressed in such a way that reconciliation could happen. Minor conflicts, misunderstandings oftentimes grow into anger. They grow into sin, and as James says, that sin then leads to death. It's incumbent upon us to do something about that, both these relational issues and the larger issues of reconciliation in the world. Jesus, in fact, said to us that we can't truly move forward in our worship until we've been reconciled to those around us. These are his words for us in Matthew chapter 25, verses 21 through 24. Jesus said, you have heard it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which means fool, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fires of hell. Therefore, Jesus says, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. So our worship is not complete if we're estranged from one another. And as we move toward that reconciliation, we find so many blessings, both personally and for our body as a whole when we do that. Matter of fact, Paul described us as ministers of reconciliation. Some other words from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. He says, from the, now on, therefore, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, as any, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ Jesus, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So Jesus invites us to that reconciliation. Paul reminds us that it's part of our identity as believers. So who do you need to be reconciled to? Think about that, friends, as we move from here today. The second thing Paul says, as well as being reconciled to others, is to trade our worry for the power of prayer. So before moving on to that issue of rejoicing, which we love to get to, I mean, that promise is so wonderful, let's address the wish issue of worry or anxiety. It's everywhere. I think that it is ramped up to new levels in our day and age, even recently. It can be debilitating for some people. It's not to be taken lightly because it, it finds itself weaving into every relationship and every decision that we make. And it's not healthy when we're always in an anxious state. And what Paul says here is that worry causes inaction. It freezes us, and it doesn't enable us to move forward then into moving toward solutions to problems or making things better. So Paul invites us to act, to trade worry for the power of prayer. And he invites us to pray specifically, not just, oh, Lord, make my day better, <laughs> but to identify those relationships, those challenges, and specifically hand those to God. And I think what happens when we do this is that we're unburdening ourselves specifically, and we're also then on the lookout for how God's going to answer that specific prayer in our lives. So what Paul gives us is both a method and a promise that we can trade our anxiety for the power of prayer. And I want to suggest to us it's not just prayers, but what Paul is suggesting is a life 
of prayer, of consistently giving to God those challenges in our lives. Now, what we call the so-called foxhole prayers, those are, those are okay. We can offer those. But Paul wants us to be moving our life so much into the life of our Lord that we give to Him everything that challenges us. It's hard for us because we get stuck in the worry mode. I will confess to you, I certainly do. My mom used to call me a worry wart, another description for me. It's not on my name tag, but it ought to be perhaps. So remember that Paul writes this as a general letter to the congregation and a letter which reminds us to share our burdens and our worries with one another, to pray together, and when we're not together, to pray for each other, to recognize the, recognize the communal aspect of rejoicing as we hold each other up in the power of prayer. One of my favorite movies through the years is the, the comedy movie Waking Ned Divine. Uh, Just a really funny movie. I enjoyed it very much. But these two older Irish gentlemen are in this relationship with just great friendship with one another. And Jackie says of his friend Michael, when we grew, he says, we grew old together, but when we laughed, we grew younger. And that's what good relationships do. They, They bring us away from the debilitating worry and move us then into the opportunity for prayer. Paul says that joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You'll find that in Galatians. Joy is to be normative for us. So let's not miss the opportunity to receive that joy from the Lord by pushing aside, giving to God our anxiety. One of my friends many years ago in a retreat where we were talked about praying to God and unburdening ourselves. And Dale said, we need to picture, this is a visual for us, we need to picture these burdens and these anxieties in our hands. And when we pray, to let them go and to give them to God. Now, Dale said the problem is that many of us put those anxieties there, and then we still hold on to a couple of them. But we're called to let them all go, to give them all to the Lord, that God might then bear those for us and with us, and as a Christian community, to bear those with us. So let's be reconciled to each other. Let's trade worry for the power of prayer. And then what I think feeds those two things very specifically, we're called to engage with things that build godly character. A life that is healthy enough to work for reconciliation and a life that trades anxiety for rejoicing needs to be nurtured. It doesn't happen automatically, and it sometimes needs a lot of help to get there. It can't happen with being fed, so to speak. So Paul says, focus on what's excellent, Focus on what's praiseworthy. And that's what is a life that honors God, that we focus on those things in our lives which move us toward Him. You don't need need me to tell you that we live in a dangerous world, a very dangerous world. What's obvious is the violence around, the prejudice, the lust, the greed, the anger, the fear. What's more insidious but equally dangerous is propaganda that passes off as truth, ignoring real needs in the lives of other people, not communicating fully, and lacking relational depth. And I feel like so many of us in this world dance on the edges of being isolated and being adrift. And we need renewal, and one of the key things for renewal is what we feed our minds. Paul said to the church in Rome, therefore be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, how do our minds get renewed? I think what Paul gave us in this passage today in chapter 8 is very much the truth. So let me read to you a different version of it in Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. He writes, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. So we need to seek those things. And you can look at this list, and I would encourage you to do so. Seek those things in your life which raise us up and elevate us and lead us, pointing us to God and God's values. Spend time in God's Word. Make that the axiom of your life. Mine it for the treasures that it is. Read it every single day. Because on the other side of things, we are pummeled by other influences. And so we need to avoid that. We need to know what to avoid. 
to don't watch things, don't focus on things that stimulate such thoughts because those things drag us down and they debilitate us and they distract us from the things that God wants to raise us up to and, and heal us with and bless us with. One of my favorite literary characters is Sherlock Holmes, and we're not going to engage in a mystery here this morning, but he's talking with Watson, his buddy, in A Study in Scarlet, which is the very first of the, of the Conan Doyle stories on him, and Watson is talking about the solar system. And Sherlock says to Watson, I don't care about the solar system. And Watson says, how can you not care about the solar system? And Holmes says this. You see, he explained, I consider that a man's brain originally is like a little empty attic, and you have to stock it with such furniture as you choose. A fool takes in all the lumber of every sort that he comes across, so that the knowledge which might be useful to him gets crowded out, or at best is jumbled up with a lot of other things, so that he has difficulty laying his hands upon it. Now, the skillful workman is very careful indeed as to what he takes into his brain attic. He will have nothing but the tools which may help him in doing his work, but of these he has a large assortment, and all in the most perfect order. It is a mistake to think that that little room has elastic walls and can descend to any extent. Depend upon it. There comes a time when for every addition of knowledge, you forget something that you knew before. It is of the highest importance, therefore, not to have useless facts elbowing out the useful ones. Now, I'm not a cardiologist or a, a neurologist, and I don't know if the brain does have its limits. I know mine does. But what I want to focus on in Holmes' quote is the quality of things, the quality of things that come to us as we're thinking, as we're, as we're navigating our way through life. And there are so many things that our world pushes on us that clutter out the good and the noble, the reputable, the authentic, and the beautiful. And we need to push those away. There's no reason for us as Christians to fill ourselves with those things when we have other things which can help us to follow God more faithfully. So what are you putting in the attic of your mind? So let me wrap things up here. Um, three questions for you. With whom do you need to work on reconciliation issues? How can you consistently add prayer to your life on a daily basis? And what are you putting in the attic of your mind? What can you increase? What can you decrease? On this Father's Day, we've had wonderful examples of fathers who have nurtured us. Many of us have had mentors in the Christian faith who have helped us as well. So think about those who have brought out the best in your life. Be reconciled to folks. Choose joy over anxiety as you pray and receive. Fill your life with those rich, deep, and noble thoughts that God makes available to us through His Word and through the beauty of the world. This is one of those most important of New Testament passages, I think, because if this was one that was memorized, it would give us access at every moment at some of the great priorities of life. But maybe one of my favorite things at all, uh, as well about this passage is that Paul talks about the peace of God being in our hearts, and then he ends by saying that the God of peace will be with us. So there is that attribute, that fruit of the Spirit that we can have, the peace of God. And it happens as we ask the God of peace to walk closely with us each and every day. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we are so thankful this day that you are the God of peace. We are thankful that you have provided your word and the companionship of your Holy Spirit to help us through our lives. You have blessed us with the fellowship of the church and for many of us families that have encouraged us as well. So, Lord, may we give all that we have to you in prayer. May we move to reconciliation with one another. And may we engage our minds in that which is lovely and beautiful and godly. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, please be seated. As I mentioned, we have a, a special prayer for Father's Day today, and I'd like to lead you and us in that right now. So would you please pray with me? Father God, giver of life and all that is good, we are grateful for your love and mercy, for your care and kind-heartedness. We believe that we are your beloved and that you have a plan for our lives. We trust you. This Father's Day, we seek your blessing for those we love and care for, our family, friends, and neighbors. We hold celebration and praise with the realities of pain and hurt, as today may bring different experiences for each of us, and even within each of us. You know our hearts. We lift up those feelings of discomfort and heaviness today. For those who long to be a parent, we ask that you give them strength for the journey. Meet them in their longing and heartache. For those who have lost a child, we pray they would feel your nearness and comfort. Be with them in their grief. May your people surround them with your love. For those who have discouraged, disappointed, and wounded their children, we pray for repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation. For those who have experienced abuse at the hands of their father or the hand of another, at the hand of another, but whose father looked away, bring them to places and people who are safe and contribute to, re to, recon to restoration and bring healing. For those who feel like they're failing, flailing in over their heads, help them to believe that you are with them. You will provide a way. May they seek you first. For those who have lost their fathers, we weep with them and ask that you would bring them comfort. May your love fill them. For those who don't know their father, draw them close today and always. Fill the ache in their heart. And God, we praise you for the way you have used fathers and father figures in our lives to show us your love and point us to your goodness. We pray for fathers either by birth, adoption, through foster care, or through raising grandchildren, for stepfathers, uncles, older brothers, and men who have stepped into an empty space. Root their identity in you. May they seek your wisdom and parent with a love like yours. For expectant and new fathers, give them a hunger to seek your will and your truth. Surround them with others that would build them up and help them become who you have created them to be. For mentors and spiritual fathers, we pray that you will encourage and inspire them. May they continue to make space in their lives for those who need them. For those who have been blessed by their fathers and celebrate them today, we thank you. May they extend your love and goodness to others around them. For those who are flourishing in their family, may they follow you with their whole life. May they be generous with the abundance you have blessed them with, welcoming others into their family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for listening to our prayers, and please, may we go with you, following you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We commit ourselves, our friends, our families, and our neighbors to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, thank you, thank you so much for being with us today. We're glad to have been here worshiping together. Please, if you'd like to know more about Christ Church, Carice will be happy to meet with you uh, in the Oak Room after the service. And would you please stand now for the benediction? Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his face upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.